welcome everyone to good morning in the evening. Thank you so much to Elm Street Books, our lovely partners in this event. Clearly, these people need very little introduction. You all know who they are. We've got Joe Scarborough, Mika Brzezinski. <laughs> Jack. My name is Catherine. Sam. And my name is Charlotte. Not mine. We'll just pretend she is, though, okay? Can we adopt her for the night? Your parents won't mind, will they? Mm, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> they have three, right? They won't mind. Yeah, they've got enough. Yeah. All right. And we also have, are you going to? Uh, yep, I was, yep. So we've also got Chris and Mike, who've joined we'll us tonight. Do you want to come on up? <laughs> All right, everybody, say hello to Mad Dog. And the guy that we have decided is the only guy we know that's grumpier than Mike Barnacle. And you can tell he's been Barnacle's friend since they were, how, how old? I was seven. I was seven when I met him. Um, he's a lot older than I am. But he, uh, so, uh, when I saw Lupica's face, I decided we needed human shields. Uh, so we've got them here. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> it's, it's always a thrill for me to come out on a Friday night and talk about a book that's not my own. So, um, <laughs> all, right. All, right. all right, kids to the back. Go with Susan. Say, um, that's my mom over there. He's talking right now. <laughs> and... <laughs> That is my babysitter, Jer. That's Clay. That's Lewis. And that's Desiree. And that's Derek. And that's Nathan. And that's Clayton. Wow. wow. Very good, Kate. That's pretty good. And for those of you who watch the show, Lewis, or pretty boy Lewis, we call him right there, is the guy who is desperately, the kid from Long Island who's desperately trying to grow a beard. So we're here to talk about Joe's book, The Right Path. Um, and uh, Mad Dog and Mike seemed perfect to join the conversation. Uh, I like to know the room. How many Republicans do we have here tonight? Oh my God. Oh dear God. I haven't seen this many Republicans in a room since I worked for I MSNBC. Thought, I thought they were going to the holding room. What happened? How many Democrats? Oh, this is perfect. This is our show, Joe. How many independents? Lord, this is incredible. How many Republicans have voted for Obama? Come on. Oh, my gosh. You actually would raise your hand? <laughs> what is wrong with I wouldn't you? admit that right now. Usually people don't admit that. Well, so this, this room really is, you know, it's a lot like our show. As you guys know, we're, you know, Meek and I are different. I'm a conservative from the Deep South. She's a liberal from the Northeast. Um, her dad ran U.S. foreign policy for four years. That's kind of exciting. Uh, my dad ran a Little League baseball team for four years. Uh, I grew up in a variety of Southern Baptist churches, and Mika grew up in a variety of young Marxist League meeting houses in Manhattan. All right. So variety is a spice of life, but, you know, it's, it's, I think it works. It works. The show works. So we're here to talk about your book, um, and I want um, Mike to jump in with the interview as well. And Mad Dog, this is going to be very interesting. Oh, because I never know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> I honest, I but I'm transfixed with your presentation. I will say that. Um, Mad Dog comes on and sits pretty in the body, and he talks like this. And he waves his hands, and his hair's going crazy. And uh, anyhow, and Joe loves Alabama football. Believe yeah. me, that. Yeah. Oh God, the two of them, too much. So, roll tide. So, okay, the okay. right path. Um, it's the question is, what is wrong? Uh, with your party, if you think there's anything wrong with it. And secondly, did you time this book out perfectly? Yes, did I, you shut I, down the government I did. and break a website? Yes, I paid Ted. I, I paid Ted Cruz to help destroy our party's brand. Uh, so you would you would want to buy the book, but so you wouldn't be so hopeless. I asked Barack Obama to botch the biggest government launch since Medicare in 1965. So it's worked out pretty damn well for me. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Mike, what, what I wanted to talk to you about, and also uh, Mr. Mad Dog, uh, Dr. Mad Dog, um, is leadership. Because I've got a theory, and it's whether you're running a football team, whether you're running a White House, whether you're running a church. At the end of the day, it comes down to strong leadership. And I'm struck by two numbers, and I want us to sort through this. The fact that the Republican Party has an 18% approval rating, 
lowest ever. Oh, look at this. We've got number one and number two here. Guys, come stand up. What is come this? Come on, no, no. I want to figure out what happens on Wednesday afternoons when my kids are downtown. What's that about? Anybody been to a jewelry store lately? Come on out. Say hi. What's going on, babe? Nice to see you guys. Have you, the, the, these hi. are our fearless leaders. Hi, good gracious me. Mika Brzezinski, how are you? Nice to meet you. Yeah, hey, this is my life. Ooh, thank you so much. That's really nice. Well, thank, thank you guys you. for coming up. I love out. New Canaan. Yeah. I love it. I like it, shopping here. You lived here for a while. I did, for a year. I lived at the Macaulay's house of, of AmeriCares, and I worked overnight, so I traveled into the city on reverse commute. Too much information. Yeah, so let's talk about, let's talk about leadership, though. The Republican Party, an 18% approval rating, all-time low, according to CBS poll. The president, lowest approval rating as ever. It looks like there's such a lack of leadership in Washington, D.C. You think? What's going on? I mean, you write about this for the Daily News I all do. the time. What's I going do. on? I, I, it, it, this, is, to me, is the most intriguing time um, in, in, in the history of American politics. I think it's the lowest time in the history of American politics. I do. I think this is the most uncivil time in this country since the Civil War. I do. And, 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 and you wonder now who wants to run. You wonder who's say, looking at this climate and saying, I want to I want to. Who leave. good. I want, yes. Who, who would put himself or herself through this meat grinder, and then, and and I'm not saying that I agree with with um, everything that Chris Christie thinks, or or everything that Chris Christie has done. And he and I got into a uh, an unfortunate little dust up when he attacked um, one of our sports writers, and 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 uh, and I, I think the front page was who who you calling dumb uh, fatso, but I I didn't write that headline. It's um, an unfortunate headline. Thank you, I, Colin. I feel I can, I, I can work myself back with him because he is a Mets fan. But here's the thing. He's a natural-born leader. He is. And I, I don't know how he can get through the meat grinder of the primary season, which are dominated by the, the slower-thinking states. But <laughs> no, no, no. This guy is Barnacle. Oh, my God. Separated He's a of birth. version of Barnacle. But he should get through that. He should get. He shouldn't have to appeal to the fringe groups of what the, the shell of what your party used to stand for. And you know, you were saying I'm a Republican. And I said, well, yeah, you're a Republican. The way Rockefeller was a Republican, the way Jake Javits was a Republican, the way LaGuardia was a Republican, and all these great names. The way Ronald Reagan was a Republican. Right. But this party that doesn't bear much relationship the fringes of it, and that's why it's going to be very interesting, because I do, I think Chris Christie is a natural born leader, and I, I think he speaks a language that voters understand. So what is it about him that makes him a natural born leader, and why does he, at this point, seem like the only prospect? Because that seems to be I, what you're saying. I, I know that the, the, his enemies now in the party think it was a calculated move, standing next to the president the way he did after Hurricane Sandy. I actually don't. I think he just thought he was doing the right thing. And, and I, I, I think he ought to be applauded for it and not denigrated by the people who say, oh, well, he doesn't think the way we I mean, think. And again, he's a, he's a natural born leader. I agree completely. Natural born leaders do. And I, I've seen this in the Republican Party. Jeb Bush, for instance, a hurricane comes on shore, the guy shuts down the state. He's tough as hell. He goes out. You, you, you know exactly what's going to be happening over the next 48, 72 hours, because he's a natural born leader. You get this in sports, too, and I'm not going to draw out this analogy. One of my favorite stories ever is the Joe Montana story. They're on, like, the six-yard line against the Bengals. I think it's the 89 Super Bowl. The San Francisco 49ers are freaking out because they got to go, like, 96 yards in about a minute and a half. Montana comes out to the field, and everybody's in the tuttles just freaking out. And Montana looks over their head. He goes, hey! Everybody's like, what? He goes, that's John Candy in the stands. And they all turn around, they go, my God, that is John Candy in the stands. And then they all said, if he's not scared, we're not scared. They drove 96 yards, they, they beat the Bengals. And in fact, the only problem with the drive is they gave the Bengals too much time. They just got down there. But let's talk about leadership, because I'm not going to lie to you. I think the Republicans have terrible leaders in Washington, D.C., and I'm so disappointed with Barack Obama, a guy that I think, like all of us, when the president raises his hand, you're an American, and you, you pray 
and you hope that they're going to succeed. He's just not succeeded in my mind. Forget the ideology. I think we're talking like Michael Dukakis said about competence and a lack of leadership. Talk about leadership that you've seen. I talked about Montana. Give me some examples well, I'll give of you a strong I'll give you sports because you, this is That's what I'm saying. politics to me is tricky. I will say one thing. I had broke our land about um, a month ago, and he said that Michelle has a rule that nobody can be in a White House after 6.30 at night. That's, that is true. And if you're a leader of the country, how about having some Republicans in there? That's what Jefferson used to do, didn't he? Yeah. How about have a little wine and cheese at 10 o'clock at night? How Maybe about have your done. kids intermingle? What about Bill Clinton at 10 o'clock at night? That guy, well, hold on. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> but anyway, no, we're not you're talking about again. Jefferson. I thought you were talking about William Jefferson Clinton. Clinton. <laughs> oh, yeah, good one. How many people have met Clinton, by the way? All of them. See? Okay, so here's the thing about presidents. Way too many people raise their hands, right? If you're a president, you would expect one or two people to raise their hands, okay? But Clinton, everywhere we go, how many people make, everybody raises their hand. He's like, it's like a Beach Boy song. He gets around, you know? And you meet him, and he's like, oh, I feel your pain. He's like, hands are all over you. It's just, you know, it doesn't you matter if you're a man or a woman. He just, he loves touching you. But that guy. Well, that's what stop and frisk is. That's what exactly. stop and frisk is. Like, exactly. I love you, Joe. I love you. But anyway, as we were saying, I, I'm going to cut you off for one second because, Mika, you have to tell this story. It's stunning what you just said about Brokaw. We had. Oh, no. We were in the White House talking to the president. We had a one on one with him for about an hour. And Mika brought up her father, a Democrat who worked for Jimmy Carter, who spent his nights in his house with Republicans and their families having dinner just about every night. And it did amazing things for the country. A couple but times a week. They had to go to state dinners and stuff, but as much as they could, they brought it to our house because they wanted the kids to meet the kids, and they, quite frankly, wanted to be home. Um, we had a state dinner that was supposed to be at the White House with the leader of China. That's how far they took it. Um, but the point Mika was... Mika had Deng Xiaoping over for dinner. <laughs> how many people have had the leader of China in there? I'm just curious, right? It's pretty good. Yeah. David Letterman said, oh, so I see you had Deng Xiaoping for dinner. I bet that was delicious. At least. But anyway. If you did, I bet you wouldn't spill caviar on his crotch and then nervously wipe it off like I did. Yeah, that's bad. Um, so the point. Worst international incident between China and the United States since like Tiananmen Matt, Square. Matt, you bring up, though, something so important because I asked him why, you know, why is there this narrative that you don't like people or like to reach out to the other side or do these events? And he said he doesn't like to do events and that he, after 6 o'clock he's upstairs. Says I'm with my kids at 6 o'clock, to which Mika said, I wish I could be with my kids every night at 6 o'clock. Well, President of the United States, you can't do that. Yeah. Oh, and, go, no. and, and read that Woodrow Wilson book. Talk about leadership. The new Woodrow Wilson book out. Unbelievable president, 1912, 1920. Go read that book about leadership and how he got America for the World War I and all the things he did for America. When you look at leaders in, in sports, I look at coaches. I look at the coaches, uh, really more football, because football is a 40-man roster, and you've got to get everybody to play hard. You look at some of the great, you know, Saban's a great leader. He gets those players to buy into what he is doing, Lombardi got his players to buy into what he's doing. Landry got his players to buy into what they're doing. Baseball is a little different because it's not, the manager doesn't have as much win-loss scenario as the football coach does. And in order to be a good football coach in today, you have to be, first of all, you've got to win. Right. You've got to believe in a guy that what, what he's selling you, Krzyzewski. You know, he wins. Yeah. And that's, and, you know, Obama has he won enough to have people really believe it. But, but you know what, you, know, you, you bring up a Seven great... Seven wins, you, you, so people follow him. You bring up a great point. There's not a great football coach, whether you're talking about Coach K or Saban, two of the best, they are wooden. They have a system. You buy into the system, and you believe in the system. You know, Alabama was down against, uh, what was it, LSU? Were we getting killed by LSU? And they asked the, the players why they weren't freaking out. They said, because we have a system, and it's very simple. The coach says you do one play at a time. He doesn't care what the score is. You do the best you can do on every play. Let's shift now to politics. President Obama just seems so detached. Detached on health care. He tells us he doesn't know the site was down. Detached on NSA. He didn't know we were tapping our, you know, our, our most important ally's cell phone. Uh, AP scandal. He didn't know that we were monitoring 
you know, the top AP, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but there, it's, there seems to be a detachment there that it's is troubling. And, and it's a shame, too, because he's, uh, he's been completely overwhelmed and hijacked by this Obamacare. He has. And I, I don't think he did it because he thought he was sinking the country. I don't think he thought he was taking it. I think he did it for the best of intentions. And this plan and this website is going to is going to overwhelm the rest of his presidency, and it's. You really think so? You yeah, think this I, is the story for yes, the next three years? I think it, it in in completely different ways. In completely different ways, this is his Iraq. It's 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 he's gonna. It, Bush got Bush. W w he couldn't get past it in his second term. It dominated the coverage every single day of the end of his presidency, and this I don't think. But, but you know, I, you know this, Joe. It's, Six months is a lifetime in, in, in politics, and, and you, you remember in the middle of the first um, Iraq war with, with George H.W. Bush, who's a, a great American, Famous. his approval rating was around 89%, and a year later, he's out of business. He's out of business because the economy tanked at that time, and so I can't tell you for certain that this is what's going to happen, but he, he's trying to push a great big rock up, up a great big hill right now. So, Joe, you write about how the party can come back, how conservatives and Republicans can again be one and uh, restore the unity and the success of the party. Is that possible even now? What should they do? Well, you know, I, I think it's possible because I think that great leadership, whether you talk about Chris Christie or another strong leader, can do anything. The first thing, though, you've got to do, and I'll just say it, you've got to speak up against the crazies in your party. And the reason why is you do two things while speaking out against the crazies in your party. One, you let the crazies know. They raise their head, you're going to knock it down. Two, you know, George W. Bush, when he campaigned in 2000, he would go to neighborhoods where Republicans usually didn't go. He didn't think he was going to win the vote there, but he wanted to send the message to, to, to swing voters that he wasn't going to be your typical Republican. Boy, that didn't work out, did it? But anyway... The thing is that I think a strong leader can, a guy like Chris Christie or uh, you know, John Kasich or whoever eventually runs, if you stand up, like uh, Bill Clinton's a great example. Bill Clinton in 1992 got nominated by a Democratic Party that had been obliterated in the last three elections. Bill Clinton would have never been nominated by Democrats in 88, in 84, or 1980 if he had been old enough. He just wouldn't have. It took them getting killed for three, three consecutive elections by Reagan, Reagan, and Bush. And then in 92, Clinton was smart enough to have that sister soldier moment where he spoke out against an extreme statement. Some people on the left were absolutely offended. Mitt Romney had so many opportunities to do that. And like Bill Clinton, to send the message, I'm a new type of Democrat. Romney could have told everybody, I'm a new kind of Republican. I'm not going to allow this. When Glenn Beck went out and said uh, that he thought the president was a racist that hated all white people, that called for leadership from a Republican. But Mitt was always scared. He was always, everybody's always, listen, I've had these guys on right-wing radio, a lot of them who used to be really good friends of mine speak out against me. And you know what I do when they speak out against me? I punch them in the face. And you know what they do after I punch them in the face rhetorically? They stop. They stop. They're bullies. And you speak out against bullies, but you've got to be strong enough to do it. You know, Bill Buckley did it. He basically disinvited the John Birchers and the Ann Rand types from the conservative movement. Ronald Reagan did it. And, and I think we need leaders, again, that are strong enough to do that, to reconnect. By the way, I've got a question for you guys. Um, how many times did a Republican win the state of Connecticut from 1972 to 1988? Every time. Every time. Republicans won Connecticut and Maine in 72, 76, uh, 80, 84, 88. Why do you know Because that? I'm blaming you. This is all your fault. 
Right. I didn't even move here till '87. It's all your fault. And don't, see, don't you, let me, you don't moved let me, here, I'm and not, it all I'm, went to I'm, hell. I'm, uh, you could talk to Mika in You're that accusatory quiet. voice, and. Oh. No. <laughs> But, but but anyway, you yeah. know, there's no reason why we can't win Connecticut again. There's no reason why we can't win Maine again. But we're not going to do it with people that don't reconnect with middle America. Governor Scarborough? No. Oh. I, I would think that would be nice. Senator? No. President? Senator John mm. Kerry. No. You talked about punching in the face, but it also means engaging. And it's just interesting because one, part of the prescription for success is and you talked a little bit about my family, is knowing each other. And you had a situation, I think, in Washington where Kate uh, was friends with a little girl, and it really did actually change the dynamic. Washington doesn't know each other. The media, I think, promulgates the problem with its you know, different corners of ideology and hatred, but everybody's so disconnected. The party yeah, is. they really are. But you, also opposite sides. You talk about your father. I mean, the thing is, in Washington, we went up to Washington, we voted, and then we went home when I was in Congress. When we all moved up to Washington for a year, when I, when I first started this show, I thought it was really interesting that, that I learned really quickly why it was great that all the members, when the members used to live there, because uh, David Frum had written something nasty about one of my friends in the National Review, it was at the beginning of the war. And, you know, I was ready to tear him to shreds. And I'm, I, I, I'm thinking about how I'm going to rip him to shreds the next day on the air. I go up and I pick up Kate in kindergarten. And as I go there, Kate says, hey, Daddy, let me introduce you to my new friend. <laughs> and she goes, runs, oh, great, baby, great, you know. And I, I go over there and, you know, I see David there. Going, Hello, David. He's like, "Hello, oh, Joe. And I was like, oh, damn, I'm going to have to be nice to this guy. So I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, you really offended me with what you said about my friend. And we talked it out. I didn't agree with him. He didn't agree with me. But we had a working relationship. And that's something that you just, just don't get in Washington anymore. And I'm blaming you, Lupica. When you were, when, when you were talking before about what, what, what I call the bullhorn media on, on, on the right, so much of their power is imagined. I mean, if they're so powerful, oh, I uh, know. if they're so powerful, how come they couldn't stop Obama from getting elected twice? If wait, they're wait, so wait, powerful, wait. Yeah. how come they couldn't run the people that they really wanted to run six years ago? And how come they couldn't get the people nominated? So, yep. so much of it, this demographic that everybody thinks so powerful, it's not that powerful. So it's a good thing to stand up to them because that bullhorn media, which is, it, it, it feeds on conflict. Yeah. Conflict and noise, and so it's perfect for this situation in, in Washington. If you stand up to them, they do go away because they're, they're not nearly as powerful, all these screamers and haters, as people think they are. Absolutely not. You were talking about why couldn't they stop Obama. Guess what? Every one of them, every single one of them, was against John McCain in 2008. Every single one well, of I always, them I wrote this was all against the time, him in Joe. 2012. How come they couldn't stop McCain from getting nominated? Yeah. They, they were all, every day, spent three hours talking about John McCain. And the only, only reason I say this is it's going to be really good when you have a Republican candidate that's got the courage to stand up. Again, just to the extremism or to some of the crazy things. Because let me tell you something. The mainstream media, and I'm going to say this now, and people say, well, yeah, aren't you the mainstream media? Yeah, but I just pretend on TV like I'm not. The mainstream media, <laughs> they love to find the craziest Republicans, right? And try to make it seem like those crazy Republicans represent all of us. Why are they able to do that? Because we don't have enough leaders who are representing us. Standing up and speaking out. And I think, I think again, that's why it's driving our approval rating uh, into the ground. Again, it's you got two countries. And basically, America right now is two countries. You got the 50%. Who going to? Uh, I'm sure if we went all over, there's a lot of communities we can go to who would hate this conversation right now. There's no middle. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground. With uh, so, how could you lead when there's so much div so much animosity for both sides? Well, specifically for Republicans, you have to win the primary, and that's such a different game uh, than winning the election. And we've seen that be problematic. Um, so my question then to you would be, how does the party unify, uh, go back to its conservative roots, which you write about, how does someone like Ronald Reagan get elected today? Is it even possible? 
I think it is possible, and I think it's possible, but you've got to do something the Republicans haven't done in a very long time. You've got to get candidates that are conservative ideologically, but moderate temperamentally. Reagan always told his staff, I don't wear the black hat. I'm the good guy. I'm the person that protects people from the excesses of government. And for some reason, our leaders these days have gotten it in their heads that fighting is enough. No, it doesn't do you well to keep picking fights that you keep losing. We've got to start winning. We've got to start putting some points up on the board. And the way you do that is by nominating candidates that actually believe what we believe. You know, Mitt Romney, I love Mitt Romney. I love his family. I know them. They're great people. But you know what the biggest problem with Mitt Romney and his 47% remark was? He believed it. He, not, he said, oh, it was a gaffe. It was a gaffe. And then after the election, the day after the election, he, he was on the phone with donors. And they said, what, did you, you know, what do you think went wrong? He goes, well, you know, there's 40% of, 47% of it. He said the same thing again. <laughs> Drove me crazy. You say he's right. I don't think he is right. I'll tell you what I think. I think what Ronald Reagan believed. I think what Margaret Thatcher believes, the shopkeeper's daughter, which is this, that free enterprise, that low taxes, that less regulations, less interference from the federal government and small business owners' lives and, and individuals' lives, that creates more freedom, that creates more opportunity, and it's a brand of conservatism if you believe it and if you apply it in all you do that helps a 17-year-old Latino in South Central LA as much as it helps a 65-year-old white hedge funder in Greenwich. Now listen. You may disagree with that. I don't. I don't. I believe less taxes. I believe less regulations. I believe more freedom. I believe letting people keep more of what they make actually encourages them to work harder and longer and hire more people and grow the economy. But guess what? But guess what? It doesn't matter whether you believe that or not. It matters that we Republicans, when we nominate somebody, that they believe that. They, they don't think it's us against them, that it's not about the 47% against the 1% on Wall Street. I mean, this is one of the things, I think a missed opportunity for Republicans as well. I talk about free enterprise and free markets and everything else. I mean, the rich keep getting richer, the poor keep getting poorer. The tax code is just absolutely insane. I would like to know why somebody making over a million dollars pays 15, 16, 17% in taxes. Why isn't there? Why, Buffett's right. Why isn't there a 30% minimum tax? If you're bringing home, you know, $10 million, $20 million, $30 million, should you really pay a lower tax rate than your secretary? You know, Ronald Reagan actually was offended by that. That's why we had the 86 tax reform. It didn't work exactly, but there are a lot of things that we Republicans can do that can reconnect us with the middle class. But the first thing is, We've got to nominate people that actually believe. And I know, I know you want me to shut up, and I will shut up. No, no, no. But so much of it has to do with the leader. You know what? You know what the genius of Ronald Reagan was? He was a guy from Eureka whose father was an alcoholic that moved from town to town, that woke up one day after working hard and being really talented in Hollywood. And he said, oh, my God. The American dream. It's real. Who have we nominated since 1988? 1988, we nominated, you know, the son of a senator. You know, 1992, the same thing. 1996 was Bob Dole. He's the exception to this. 2000, we nominated the son of a president. 2004, we nominated the son of a president. 2008, we nominated the son of a guy that ran the United States Navy during Vietnam. 2012, we nominated a guy that ran a car company in Michigan. Those, and it, yeah, who's the governor of Michigan? There's a reason our presidential candidates are disconnected. You know what the, you know what, I think the best experience for me as a politician was Mike Lupica. I was always a very conservative guy. My dad was very conservative. He was unemployed. He worked for Lockheed. He was unemployed for a year and a half in the early 1970s during the recession. I remember driving around the southeast with him 
as he was trying to find a job that was good enough to you know, pay the bills and everything else. And for the first time, I saw my dad actually struggle. Uh, eventually, he had to get unemployment. And I remember him saying in Mississippi at the time, it was enough to fill up the tank and buy a bag of groceries. I remember being in college with my other young Republican friends at the University of Alabama, and boy, we were conservative. I remember kids saying to me, you know, basically, you know, welfare, when you, you know, anybody that wants a job can get a job. You're just lazy if you don't get a job. And I was thinking about that summer in noon in Georgia when it was 95 degrees and my dad was having to walk inside only to be humiliated one more time, coming back out and, you know, having his kids know that he didn't, you know, he didn't get the job. I mean, Reagan understood that. So much of this goes back to what you said at the beginning, leadership. But Christie gets it. My, uh, my 89-year-old father, who was a bombardier in B-24s, and war, he's 20 years old, flying over Europe in the night in, in 1944. He wanted to be a pilot. They needed bombardiers. My dad became a bombardier. And I, on, on the cork board in front of my desk where I write, I have the list of his missions. And I have him, a picture of him looking as skinny as an exclamation point, standing next to his fellow crew members. And Joe, I have to tell you, he's, he's not this or that politically. Right. He's, he's a natural born leader. He believed in all the things that we want to still believe in in America. And he's appalled at what he sees going on. He's appalled at what he hears coming out of Washington. He's appalled at this bickering and infighting and, and that, has, that has risen barely to the level of a playground stare, stare down. And, 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 he, and let me tell you something else about my dad. He never bought into any of that greatest generation. He said, we didn't think we were great. We thought we were doing what we were supposed to do. The day of the marathon bombing, my dad called me up. And he said, you know, all that greatest generation stuff, he said, those people who ran into the street today, they were as brave as anything we did in World War II. And, and there are days when my dad l watches the news, and here's what's coming out of the people who are supposed to lead this country, and he will say to me sometimes, wait a minute, is this what I fought for? And you know, the thing is, we have so many, we see this time and time again, the disconnect between Washington and the rest of America. You know, we have a reason. We have a lot of reasons to be excited. We really do. We've been losing manufacturing jobs since the 1970s. The average wage for men since 1971 has gone down every year. But right now, manufacturing jobs are starting to come back. We went to Detroit. So what Ford and the UAW was doing together. We've got an energy revolution coming with natural gas, which we were supposed to run out of in the next 10 to 15 years. By 2020, we're supposed to have the largest, uh, be the largest oil exporters in the world. So I mean, we've stumbled into this. Like Bismarck said, there's a divine providence for fools, drunkards in the United States of America. He's right, but I'll take it. Better to be lucky than good. So it's going to be, we have the most productive workers in the world. We're going to have some of the lowest energy prices in the world. We've got the most talented people in the world. We really do. Steve Jobs was right. We're crazy. We think different. The Chinese are still trying to figure out how to think like us. We hear about the great threat from China, and there is a great th threat from China. But you know what Chinese students complain about the most? to their instructors, that they can't make them think like us. That you can't have a guy that changes the world by borrowing $5,000 and starting Microsoft with a bunch of potheads in Berkeley, California. Or you can't get a guy that was inspired by listening to the White Album and dropping acid, changing the way we live and making my kids buy a new Apple product every six months. It drives me crazy. But we have so many built-in advantages. That's what your father fought for. That's what my father fought for. That's what we all believe in. And we can get it. We really can get it. But we've got to figure out a way to get the best people back down to so, Washington. I mean, look, uh, you talked about Chris Christie and the signs of leadership that he's showing so hopefully. Um, you talk about these things every day on the show. You say these things, you're consistent, you've been saying a lot of what you've written in this book for a long time, but the time has come for the message of the book. 
and yet I can't believe what I see on Twitter. Mad Dog, are you called any other names besides Mad Dog on Twitter? I'm sure I am. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I have seen what I'm called, can't say any of it. You're called a rhino, um, and that's when they're being nice. I'm not on on Twitter? on Twitter? No. You're you know a smart what? guy. No He's Facebook. smart, isn't he? No, I, I, I barely have an answering machine, so. <laughs> I'd keep it that way. Um, but, you know, the, and I wish I could live that way, but that's most of America's... No, I, let me tell you one other thing. Let me yeah. tell you one other thing. Um, if you go to the Daily News website and you go to the page where my column is, whether it's the sports column or the political column, you will notice there is a glaring absence. I, I don't... Uh, there's no reader comments at the end of that because that has become this vile bulletin board of American life. And I don't know what rule there was ever passed that you, you, you were allowed to go. And I say, here's what I said to him. I said, you can run those comments or you can run my column, but you can't do both because let them get their own space. I, you know, I started writing. I was working nights at the Boston Globe and writing for three school papers to get this space. That's my property. And I... So some guy who calls himself, um, I don't know, Pitbull or something, Pitbull, <laughs> some mouth breather. And, and um, <laughs> no, it, you know, it, you, you can write me a letter if you want to, but you can't go on the page where my column is. So you guys saw Susan here. I remember one time, probably about five years ago, I'm walking past her, and I'm walking to the living room, and I'm walking across like this, you know. New York Magazine had just written a really nice article about me, and it was just so weird. So I'm walking past, and I just feel Susan and this heavy presence. And I swear to God, without looking back at her, I went like this. I'm walking past, I go, do not read the comments. And I just kept walking. <laughs> I'm serious. They, they are crazy. Those people are hateful, and it's usually 1% of the total readership that just churns that way. And, that you know, I, I think... I think it is toxic, but here's the thing. You've figured out how to sort it out. My Twitter feed, I have so many people saying so many ugly things, but you know what? I scan past it now. I figured it out after eight years in Congress, you know, I'd be, you know, at the beginning you would get the letters to the editor and they'd say Scarborough's a Nazi. I'd be like, what? You know, eight years into it, yeah, I'd be eating my cereal and they say Scarborough's a Nazi and, you know, he, he, he kills and eats baby dogs, you know what I mean? And I go, Huh, I wonder if the Braves won last night, and I'd flip over. And I think if Washington's going to find its way, and they're going to stop losing their head, they've got to learn how to filter a lot of this negative stuff out. Because it is. You know, I had an admiral tell me one time, Admiral Fetterman, who, who helped run Navy training, he came up to me one time, and there was a guy that just kept picking at me. At a, at a speaking event I had, and, and the Admiral, I was 30, 31 at, a at the time. The Admiral knew that the guy was really getting to me, and afterwards he pulled me up. He goes, Congress, come here. I go, yes, sir. He goes, you got to learn how to separate and learn how to separate the signal from the ground noise. There's a lot more ground noise than signal all the time, but you find that signal, and you stay focused on it, and you'll be fine. And I think that's what Washington needs to do. Let's, let's get the signal from out there now. Can I go get them? Yes. So Mika's going to play Oprah. <laughs> Check under your seats for car keys. So we're going to open it to a go! few questions. And you guys can ask Mike, Mad Dog, or Joe anything. It doesn't have to be about politics. It could be about the right path or not. Any or questions? the Giants or the or Jets the Giants or Alabama you. football. Real All time. right. Um, I'm going to have to... Or the Red Sox, yes. What about that? What a year. What a season, Mike Lupica. So um, I want you to respond to the comment that uh, the Republican Party will never win a national election as long as they hitch their wagon to legislating uh, reproductive rights and, and, and being anti-gay rights. Well, I think, I think uh, we were just talking about Chris Christie. I think this is what is so remarkable about true leadership. I, I think what's happened is since 19, you know, probably since 1992, uh, 1996, there's been an overwhelming focus, not just on making sure that the candidates are pro-life and 
what Republicans would say, pro-family. But that that took a not, you know, that that took the preeminent place in their party platform. Chris Christie, the first pro-life official statewide uh, to be elected since Roe v. Wade was passed in 1973. But you know what? He basically said, I'm Catholic and pro-life. And then he moved on. He said, now let's talk about how we get you back to work. And listen, that, that's the thing that's so insane about pro-life. People would ask me the same thing. In 1994, I ran in a district, you know, northwest Florida, the Redneck Riviera, um, L.A., Lower Alabama, um, A.A., America's Albania. I mean, there are a lot of names for it. Jerry Falwell called it the most conservative district in America. You know, I, I was, though, the first Republican elected since 1872 there. They hung the last one they sent up there. But you know I handled the issue in this district that Jerry Falwell says the most conservative ever? I went to all the people that, like, pro-life issues mattered to, and I said, I'm pro-life. I'm not going to talk about it on the campaign. But I just went, I'm pro-life. And then I would talk about economics. I'd talk about getting America back to work. I'd talk about saving entitlement programs. I would talk about issues that all Americans should be concerned about. And if somebody asked me, where do you send abortion? I'd be, well, I'm pro-life. But I'm not, I'm not in the Senate. And by the way, the Supreme Court's going to decide this and not me. And I won. You know, I got 62% of the vote. And I had a lot of people that were pro-choice that voted for me uh, because they knew that wasn't going to be my obsession. We as a party have to de-emphasize, I think, a lot of these issues. We don't need to compromise, but we certainly need to de-emphasize the issues. The world has changed, and we have to recognize that. And, and too many people are still locked in 1980. Yes? Very good. Shorter answers. Next question. Okay. <laughs> I've got a three-hour show. I can go on all night. I grew up in a household where the kind of dialogue that you two have happened constantly in my living room, and I would listen as a child to people bitterly sometimes fighting it out, but with grace and with respect. What my question is more personal, how did you guys come up with this type of synergy and process? Uh, well, Joe came up with the show, and uh, he held me hostage at MSNBC. So uh, Mika was actually hosting, uh, or, uh, actually Mika was doing cut-ins. I was Can I tell the story? and working yeah. freelance, and I did not want to work mor mornings again, but go ahead. So yes. she was I working freelance, and I was in Florida, because I, you know, I got out of Congress, I went home, I was raising my kids, and MS asked me if I could do, want to do a show. I said, I'll do a show, but I got to do it out of Florida. They let me do it out of Florida. And so it was, it was really, it was the great American scam. I'd take my kids to school, I'd coach baseball, I had a great life, and then about 8 o'clock at night I'd get off the boat and I'd go to a PBS station with like shorts on and a jacket, and, you know, and a tie, and welcome to Scarborough country, and I'd rant for 30 minutes, and then I'd go, and now let's go to Mika Brzezinski with the news you and your family need to know. And then Mika would go and she'd talk for 30 seconds, and because uh, she just did the cut-ins. And at the end she'd always go, and now back to... Scarborough country. And the next day on the boat, one of my friends said, dude, that woman is making fun of your show. <laughs> oh, no, she's not. No, that's just the way she talks. And so the next night, it's the same thing now, back to Scarborough country. And I said, oh my God, she is making fun of my show. So when Don Imus made a mistake and talked about women's basketball, I went up to New York. Phil Griffin asked me to uh, consider doing the show. And I saw Mika in the newsroom. And I'd, we'd been working like this way for six months. I never met her. I said, hey, Mika, I just want you to know I, um, I, uh, I know you're making fun of my show. To which Mika said, how can I make fun of a show I've never even watched? I was just telling the truth. She was telling the truth. She never watched the show. She'd be calling her kids. She'd be working on their homework with them. Then she'd do like, oh, wait, I get it. Do the cut in. Then she'd turn me off. Then she'd do the show again. And I immediately called Phil. I said, Phil, we just found our co-host. Because Phil Griffin was trying to get me. You know, originally the idea was we're going to get Charles. We're going to get like the Charles sidekick that Don has. And then he said, well, no, no, no. Let's get somebody a little different. 
And he was like bringing all these 25 year old women with like blonde curls out to here and I won't tell you what else, but it was like, I was like, Phil, you do understand we're going to be talking for three hours without a teleprompter about Middle East like, peace process and quantitative easing. I, I need somebody that can keep up. And so after Mika insulted me just like that, I said, this will work. When we got on and the air did. the next day, it actually just was very natural. The report was just there. It wasn't something we had to create. Um, did you have a question? Okay. Good evening, Mr. Scarborough. Um, I'm an aficionado of your morning show, oh. and it's a genteel accompaniment to my morning toilette. <laughs> <laughs> and we're finished. <laughs> Next question. <great. laughs> All right. And um, I do know one thing. What's that? You You're not from Northwest Florida. Go ahead. I know that. Go ahead. No, no. I know that you love Florida and Floridians. It's very clear the way you talk about it in your program. Right. A couple of weeks back, I was in Florida, and I happened to meet uh, a doctor, a doctor who practices not in the high-rolling areas of South Beach or right. whatever, and his practice is in actually in rather one of the more poorer areas, and he was extremely upset with the governor of Florida who, as you know, prevented the extension of Medicaid. Of Medicaid, right. And he expressed himself such that he said, the governor has blood on his hands. Yeah. Do you think, that, do you think he's correct? I, d I don't know if I'd say the governor has blood on his hands. I, d I do wonder, though, how these states that are complaining about the negative impact of, of health care reform can actually reject this medi Medicaid funding uh, with, with, with as many people suffering uh, the way they are under, under uh, second, third rate uh, health insurance plans or no insurance plans at all. I, I actually think, I think if I were governor of, of Florida or any state, I would do that. They have some concerns about funding in the out years, but there's such a shortage and medical care for the poor is so horrific in all of these states, I don't know how you don't take the money. Um, so, well, I gotta say one other thing too, really quickly, for any libertarians in here that say we don't like the Affordable Care Act because it's a federal government involved in, our, in, in healthcare, don't take Medicare, first of all. And secondly, if you think that people going into emergency rooms at night and taking their kids in emergency rooms at, at, at one o'clock in the morning because they can't afford any other sort of health care is not passed on to all of us, then you're living in a dream world. And in fact, that way is less efficient and ends up costing us more money because it allows big hospitals to pass that money, uh, pass those charges on to us. It's far more efficient for us to figure out a way to get everybody insured than do it that way. Yes. Joe, this is Tim. Tim, stand up. Hi, Look Tim. at his pants. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> Some Nantucket Reds on you, baby. Who wears those pants? All right. Uh, Thank you so much. I like your taste too, right. Tim. So let's let's talk student debt for a little bit. All right. Okay. Okay. So, like. How much do you have? A lot. A lot. Okay. I'm working on it. I'm working okay, on it. Okay. Listen, right. I've got a deal. It's like about a 17% loan. We'll talk to you uh, after the. All right, guide. All right. So. Honestly, I was thinking about it, and us, me, we, the millennials, right? You're welcome for bringing down the average age in this room. But anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, we were promised... Brought it down to 81.3. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Nantucket. It's something. It's something. It's a start. All right, anyway, we were promised a white picket fence, but we didn't know that Uncle Sam was really Tom Sawyer. What? type of leadership is really going to take effect that's going to be something recognizable that we can actually earn a living wage and afford assurance. Yeah, Mike, Mike uh, m let me pass this on to you, Mike Lupica. The, right now, the student loan situation, the student loan debt that we're all carrying, that is the next bubble that's going to burst. And we're all going to pay. I mean, it, this is a massive, massive problem. 
that the media is not thinking about or talking about oh, enough. Oh, and I, I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to, I've sent, my, my two oldest sons have gone through college. I've got a boy who's a senior in college now, and it's not, that there, to me, I, I would not say that this is the most pressing concern in America. It's not, okay? But, but, these, uh, these children are our future, okay? And we cannot have them drowning in debt when they try to embrace the country of possibilities that we want this to be, that we do, when they're when they're formulating their own dreams and they're reaching for the sky, we can't have them thinking, no, I've got to, I've just got to get through the next five years, you know. And I was lucky enough that I didn't face that when I got out of college, okay. And 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 to me, that is a way of stepping on the best and the brightest in in this country and. Tim, I wish I had an answer for you. I don't, but but you know what? There's got to be a better way than this. Well, and 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 the, the cost of education has just skyrocketed. I mean, it's, really, it's, I hadn't it, picked up on that, Joe. No, it, no, it, it, it's just insane. You know, I'm sorry if you feel the need to be a smartass for whatever reason. You go ahead and be a smartass. But I was about to say, I went to two state state schools in the South, and you know. I used to put five hundred, seven hundred and fifty dollars a semester. Law school at University of Florida, I ended up paying like a thousand dollars a semester. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable now. You you can't. I mean, you just you you can't can hardly go anywhere. You know, make it go. On the, let's Hi, go on the right here. Uh, simple question. Uh, getting back to the right way. How does Chris Christie actually make it to Super Tuesday? Uh, how does he get past the crazies in Iowa? The winner of that, who wins in South Carolina, the Rand Paul freaks in New Hampshire, and the and wait, the, wait, I'm from New Hampshire, and I, you know, and, and wait a that's minute. Mr. Freak to you. And and and, and, and waiting for him is uh, Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush in Florida. How does he actually get there? Yeah, you know, I, I, Mika and I are really good friends with Chris, and we can say this now uh, because I'm sure the Game Change Boys wrote about it in their book. He, we went out to dinner with him. My gosh, and. 2011, early 2011, he was trying to sort through this. And we talked with him nonstop, and he was trying to make his decision. He called me up one day, and he, he asked that question. He goes, Joe, I want to run. He said, but what state do I win? I, he said, do I win Iowa? I said, no, you don't. Do I win New Hampshire? Probably not. Do I win South Carolina? No. Do you win Florida? I doubt it. And so Chris says, by three, you know, three weeks in, they're going to call me a loser, and I'm going to be drummed out. I think what Chris has to do is he's got to focus on New Hampshire. He's got to win New Hampshire. He's got to understand he'll never win Iowa. He'll never win South Carolina. Who knows what happens in Florida if Jeb's not in there. I think Jeb might be in there. But listen, here's the deal. I, I, I wrote a column in the beginning of 2012 uh, for Politico. The title was Crazy Never Wins. You know, everybody always thinks it's always the crazies that are going to win. And we heard about Herman Cain. We heard about Michelle Bachman. We heard about Rick Perry, even when the guy couldn't even remember his last name. And I wrote the crazy never wins because I talked about my dad. Guys like my dad, they voted for Nixon. They voted for Reagan. You know, they voted for Ike. They were, they were Main Street Republicans. Chris Christie has to do what Rudy Giuliani could not do. Rudy ran a terrible campaign. But listen, here's the deal. Those four, first four states that we all focus on for two years, once you make that turn, you go to the Midwest. And that's really, forget the ground noise, that's where the elections are won. When they turn to the Midwest, they turn to the Northeast, suddenly delegates start rolling in. New Jersey's probably going to be winner-take-all this time. New York's going to probably be winner-take-all this time. Connecticut's going to probably be winner-take-all this time. And those are states, and Chris Christie can tell his people. And he needs to set expectations low the second he gets there and say, I'm not going to even campaign in Iowa. John McCain didn't campaign in Iowa. It was a smart move. And then he needs to win New Hampshire. He needs to come in second in New Hampshire. But he needs to keep telling people, we're going to make that turn from the early states. If you do who okay? Thinks this is a good system. No, I mean, yeah. who thinks that somebody should be declared? Think of it when that, Iowa. And no, New no, Hampshire. but I'm, I, I understand that. And I grew up in New Hampshire. But who thinks that this is a working template yeah. from the American political system where 
you can well, you can get 28,000 votes on a Tuesday night in Iowa and get declared the front runner as Michelle Bachman was. Who's mad as a hatter and 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 then she was the, she stopped being the front runner and you're right then comes Herman Cain yeah. the frisky Herman Cain and then he's the front runner and 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 then and then Rick Perry is the front runner and uh, you and but who thinks this that, that that's something that has to be looked at obviously this not you let, let, okay, so let's have a sport. Now, if your party wants to win. Any questions on sports? We got Mad Dog here. He's going to tell you what's wrong with the New York Giants and why they're going to end up winning the NFC East. Uh-oh. Yes, ma'am. What about the Knicks? Bad. Bad team. Question, what about the Knicks? Bad team. <laughs> Bad. Bad team. Bad team. They have no secondary score. Carmelo Anthony makes nobody around him any better. Oh. They have a crazy owner who gets in the way. They are a dysfunctional team. The Knicks will be the fifth seed, knocked out in the first round of the postseason. Oh, my God. If you God. have season tickets, and if you are, uh, I'll say this. If anybody is silly enough to spend the money that NBA teams want you to spend for season tickets on NBA regular season games that mean absolutely nothing, you need your head examined. Because right now. Aren't you glad you came tonight? <laughs> because Mike would say the same thing. Right now, I can name probably seven, maybe all eight of the NBA final uh, of the four teams in each conference. The Heat are going to be the one seed. The Bulls will be in the mix. The Nets will be in the mix eventually, and the, the those three. The Pacers. And the Pacers right. will be in the mix. And in the West, you can the Rockets, the Spurs, the Clippers, and Oklahoma City. I can, why are you playing eighty-two games? And then you're going to spend $100, and then you're going to spend $1,500 to go to the games to watch the, those games. So anybody who calls the can NBA I, regular season games can I ask needs you, their heads examined. Can I ask? Well, well when are you I going back you, to the garden? Do you, do you take back your question? Can I ask you one question? If there's no point in playing the season, I, I don't think there you, is. Were you proclaiming the Red Sox, the World Series champion, on, say, the 18th of March, or do you think it's a good idea that they went ahead and played the season? I agree, but in the NBA, I think it's a good enough. idea. I think it was a good idea. In the NBA, the one player dominates. LeBron James is going to be in the Final Four. And you can't predict that in baseball. Look at the Angels, Pujols, Hamilton, great players, haven't done a thing. So you need, in the NBA, the one, two guys go such a long way in having a team be successful. And that's why you can, you know, you're telling me that Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook are not going to be playing in the middle of May? They're going to play 82 games now to get there. They're going to win 55, but they're going to be, so that's he, the problem with the NBA. Yeah, he says you've lost all hope. So I wouldn't waste my time. Uh, well, listen, if anybody thinks that Alex Rodriguez didn't do, didn't do steroids, you're freaking crazy. I am done. He is okay, so I'm seeing a trend here. He is You're so crazy. <laughs> he is so guilty. And did you hear what he did today? He didn't. If he was supposed to appear in front of Major League Baseball today, and he got a doctor's note in L.A. that he had flu-like symptoms and he couldn't get out of the aircraft. Oh my gosh! He will get. I will be shocked if he doesn't get 150 games. I think Mike would agree with this. I will be shocked if he doesn't get 150 games, and I think the Yankees will be able to use that $25 million eventually to add some extra players for next year. Do you agree with that? He, uh, he has currently sued Major League Baseball, the Yankee Doctors, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. <laughs> he will eventually sue his own union. He will, you, just, you can start marking time until that. And, 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 so, and he has made this case about everything except what Chris just talked about. Did he buy the drugs and did he use the drugs? He wants it to be about the investigation. He, he's the single biggest phony I've ever met in my newspaper career. Yeah. Far corner, yes sir.
Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so actually, I, I, I talk about this in the book. This is actually something that Richard Nixon thought about as early as uh, 1972. He won the election, and then he started talking about starting a third party that was economically conservative and socially moderate. And he actually even talked to John Connolly about being the independent candidate in 1976. They got everybody together. They talked about it and seemed like a great idea. And then Watergate hit. Um, but I, I've just, I've got to say, I, Mika and I have probably given 400 speeches over the past five, six years to just a variety of groups. And I got to say, I, the most surprising thing is we say the same thing at every speech, uh, same policy prescriptions. And whether we're talking at the 92nd Street Y or whether we're talking at Pat Robertson's University in Virginia, um, People applaud at the same lines. They laugh at the same things. When you say a president, any president should not, we shouldn't root against the president because if we're rooting against the president, we're rooting against America. And I remember saying this. I said, you know, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to say it to Pat Robertson's. I'm going to challenge them. I said, you should not be, it's right after Rush Limbaugh said he, that he was rooting against the president. I said, you can't root against the president without rooting against America. Your charge tonight is to go home and pray for the president. Because I saw my grandmother pray for Jimmy Carter. And if you can pray for Jimmy Carter, you can pray for anybody. And before I said the Jimmy Carter thing, I said, you need to go home and pray for the president. They actually gave us a standing ovation at Pat Robertson's University in 2009 at the height of anti-Obamism. Americans are, I, I promise you, you can watch cable news at night, you can listen to talk radio, you can go on your internet, and you can believe what you want to believe. But I promise you, as somebody that has been out talking for five, six years, Americans are a lot more divided, I mean, a lot more united, and a lot less divided than it looks on TV. Wouldn't you say so, Mika? Oh, absolutely. It's pretty stunning. They want what we're talking about. We've yeah. got to figure out how to get there. We really do. All right. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Mike.